Hi, my friends. The news today is not that good. Uh, Richard McPhill passed away, and he was super important for Genesis, from the very beginning to around the lamp. He helped them with everything, from tours to just keeping together. And uh, he helped me too, with my book and my future books too. I have some audios that I want to share with you, and for sure you will like it. It's 1972, April and August. Okay, April the, and August. The, the Italian tours. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And how was that? It's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable because, you know, we were playing to 20 people in a basement in, you know, outside of Manchester or whatever. And then suddenly we get invited to Italy. We had... I personally, maybe the band knew better than me, but I had no idea that, that how many people had bought the records. And uh, at that time, it, it was nursery crime, of course, and perhaps uh, trespass. But um, we arrived um, really bad, badly, especially in April, under-equipped. And suddenly we were playing in these huge places, you know, thousands of people showed up. And, and it was a very, very pleasant surprise. And not only did they knew exactly what to expect and they would sing along in the, to the songs. And also, you know, the Italians are very, um, they're more, this is a silly thing to say because it's so obvious, but they're, they're so much more emotional than <laughs> English <Yeah>. people. <laughs> and they would clap. Uh, completely unexpectedly you know not it wasn't it wasn't like a jazz thing where you know they clap after the solos yeah they they would somehow just pick up on the emotion and they'd all start clapping and cheering in the middle of the songs and i i of course was right in the middle of the crowd yeah. doing the mixing the sound although the sound was as i say firstly we were hopelessly under equipped to 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 fill a place like that but actually it didn't really matter because mostly the concerts were in like basketball uh, places indoor but quite big and very very echoey yeah of course so what i could do on the soundboard was very limited um and so <laughs> it was the levels yeah they loved it and we loved it and it, it was a it was a it, it was a very, very, the thing that's the most important to say about those Italian tours is that it, it, um, it gave the band an enormous boost in confidence because, you know, Trespass came out, Ant left, and then we replaced John Mayhew. And then um, that band, that's when, then we got Steve. In fact, it was easier to, to, re to replace, um, Phil came very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and but we couldn't find a guitarist that was right, and and in fact we actually did some gigs as just as a four piece, and um, and we got Tony um, an electric piano. Uh, it's called a Hona Pianet mm -hmm. that he plugged it. He he we literally plugged it into Ant's amp on the other side of the stage. We put a fuzz box on it, mm -hmm. and he would play the guitar solos while playing the on the on the organ. The, the harmonies in the left hand. So yeah. we did several yeah. gigs like that. And then after a few weeks, Steve, uh, he put an advert in the Melody Maker. You know, I'm sure you know all this. Anyway, the, the, the classic five piece came together by the end of 1970. And then they set about writing and recording Nursery Crime. Uh -huh. And it, it, we, we had high hopes for Nursery Crime. Uh, because you know things were building, but very slowly, um, and it wasn't. It wasn't. It didn't set the world on fire. It wasn't a success, and you know it, things had sort of plateaued a bit mm -hmm. until in April '72 we 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 go to Italy, and suddenly there's huge crowds and people are just loving it, and I think the band actually then realised that it was that they needed to keep going. Yeah. And because if Italy would like it, why wouldn't everybody else, you know? So 
um, it came at a very, very important time, those, those two tours. And of course, they were such fun. It was Italy, such a lovely place. It's not just because of the food. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it made a big difference. And, yeah. you know, we, we, we would, yeah, I've talked about it in the book, you know, we would go to, um, we would go to the gig about uh, 10 or 11 in the morning, everybody. And all there was in this huge, big echoey basketball place was, was just a stage. Yeah. And we'd back the van up the, the truck to the, to the stage and unload everything. And everybody would do their own thing rather than the roadies getting there first and yeah. the, the traditional way of doing it. So everybody would set up their own stuff, which was great, do a sound check and then go to eat. And, and we would eat this incredible Italian meal. Yeah, <laughs> restaurant. Maurizio, Maurizio the, 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 uh, the, the promoter, would order everything because we didn't know what to order. Yeah, of course. And, uh, and then we'd go back to the hotel and collapse, you know, in a drunken stupor and sleep <laughs> like the dead. Yeah. And then get up and go and do the concert. <laughs> so what's not to like? It was, it was absolutely wonderful. Crazy, yeah. but wonderful. That's where it was. Ah, cool. Absolutely. Ah, cool. There you go. Yeah. yeah. No, I, well, no, I remember very well. That's where it was. Yeah. And that's where, because, you know, again, I talk about this in my book, but um, uh, I used to go in the morning with the roadies, set everything up. And then the band would come, 10 o'clock, and we would then go off to go to the office and deal with money and stuff and you know gigs and then we'd go to the music shops because there was always guitar strings drumsticks tambourines microphones all bits and bits stuff that all had to be done yeah um, and then we'd come back at about four or five o'clock in the afternoon and one on one occasion you know they they said uh, we've just finished this piece Do you want to sit down and they played Supper's Ready. And, you know, it was the first time I heard it. And um, the other place where uh, some of Supper's Ready was, was written was um, Tony Stratton Smith's house in a place called Crowborough. He had a house in Sussex, out south of London. Oh. Um, and the bands often, all the charisma bands would go down there in the summer. The feedback was very good, absolutely. Um, and it was a major step up and mm. but it's not unconnected from those gigs in Italy because the band learned how to handle bigger audiences and from that moment things really took off uh. and I, I always remember the rainbow um, which I think was in November or December of that year and it suddenly felt like wow you know the band has made it. This is special. This place is packed. And they they went, you know, there was a 10 minute standing ovation at the end. Yes. And uh, there we were in this huge theatre, it's like four, four and a half thousand people. And uh, it, it, it really did, it took off from there. It really did. I mean, obviously, then came Selling England which in many ways I think is their best album. Um, that band, I think it was their peak, because obviously, you know, you'll come on to this, but The Lamb was difficult. Yeah. I, st I still I think there's some incredible stuff on The Lamb, but it's, it, 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 it was a very difficult time. When Foxtrot happened, it was the first time that we had a proper mixer in, in the audience. I mean, actually, it was in, in that summer of 72. Before that, I was out the front, but we, uh, we, we, we couldn't afford the big cable. It's a very expensive piece of stuff. Honestly, we couldn't afford one. So I would be on the floor in front of the speakers, um, right under the stage, mixing as best I could from yeah. there. It's not ideal. No. Um, and I'm quite sure that that's what damaged my hearing because I now wear hearing aids. 
<laughs> I'm I'm still suing them, but <clears throat> they're not paying. No, don't want to pay. <laughs> yeah, that was in America. He is to get me to set a mic up during the sound check at the mixing desk so that he could hear what the band sounded. He could hear what I was hearing. Mm -hmm. He didn't trust me to do it properly. Yeah. So <laughs> he was just, he was interfering. Just, just to be sure, right? <laughs> so yeah. I would go, yes, 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 Peter, yes. And then he, once he was back up on stage, I'd, <laughs> he was the first one to really capture how good they were on, on record. I was, as I said to you, I was always disappointed in the sound of, of Nursery Crime and Trespass, just because I heard them play every night. Yeah. And I heard the recording and I thought, this is, that's not what they, they, they can sound better than that. Uh -huh. But it was John Burns that, that was the first one to capture that um, for, on Foxtrot. Yeah, uh, and it, 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 funnily enough, it was one of the things that um, to do with my decision to leave the band in 1973 was that I felt with Foxtrot they really had made a record that sounded like them, mm -hmm. and and in a way, in a certain way, my my job was done. No. You know, I wanted them, I wanted the world to know how good they were. Yeah, and with Foxtrot, we achieved that. When I when in 1969, um, I'd been, you know, all around the place. Went to Israel and did lots of different things. And they they were rehearsing at, down at Ant's house, and I went down, and they played me some of the songs they ended up on, Trespass, and I suddenly it clicked in my brain that these weren't just my friends, you know, these were, this was good. This was really good. And it, <clears throat> so it became a vocation for me. It became something I wanted to dedicate my life to, to, to make sure that they, the, the world found out the same as me.